Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church. We are grateful to God that you're here this morning. If you're a guest with us, you want a little gift on the way out. If you want to drop a little uh, little membership card or uh, information cards in front of you, drop it off out there in the vestibule and grab one of these. Somebody commented to me in the first service before church. They said, I love my coffee cup. He said, I fill that thing up in the morning. And I always, here's what I say. It's very large. So you could put two cups of coffee in this. And then when you go to the doctor and he starts to <laughs> indict you about how much caffeine you drink, you just say, I drink two cups in the morning. He doesn't have to know they're almost a gallon, each one of them. <laughs> but we'll just keep that between us and, uh, and you, all right? But anyway, we're grateful to God that you've chosen to worship with us. Uh, Josh is going to come this morning, read to us from the Psalms. We're going to have a great day of worshiping the Lord, great music this morning, and hearing from God's Word. Good morning, church family. Good morning, church family. I uh, just want to welcome you this morning. I am reading from Psalm 86, uh, 1 through 13, and it says this. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am godly. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all the day. Glad the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. In the day of trouble I call upon you, for you answer me. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. Let's pray this morning. Father, Lord, we are thankful this morning, Lord, for, for your steadfast love. Lord, we are, are thankful, Lord, this morning that there are no works like yours, Father, that, that you are sovereign. And, uh, Father, we just come to you here this morning. Uh, we come to worship you, Lord. We come to worship you, uh, to give thanks to you, Lord. And just to praise your name, Lord. And, and we ask, Lord, that you just even help us to do that this morning with our whole heart. And, uh, Father, we lift our service up to you, Lord, from, from singing praises to you, Lord, to, uh, to prayer, uh, to, to even just the, the fellowship, Lord, especially even before uh, Brother Chris bringing your word this morning, Lord, that everything we do here this morning brings you the utmost glory and the utmost praise. Lord, and so we, we just lift our service up to you. Father, we're thankful, Lord, that you love us. We're thankful for Jesus, Lord, and, and the love and the grace that you give us through the blood of the cross. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, good morning, First Baptist. Uh, first of all, quick announcement. We are going to restart choir practice today at 430. So please come and join us, certainly if you've been in the choir. But if you have not and would like to join us, do that as well. We're going to start this morning's worship with Blessed Assurance. So this is the same hymn and tune and notes uh, with just a little bit snappier uh, rhythm. And then we're going to go right into You Are Worthy of My Praise. We haven't sung this in years. We pulled it up out of the archives. There's a, uh, the men will lead off and the women sing what's in parentheses. You sort of echo us. Just follow us along up here. And let's all stand together and worship.
name to be proclaimed to the nations. You are worthy because you have created everything out of nothing. You are worthy because you have made us out of the dirt of the earth. You are worthy because you sent your son to a place called Calvary to lay down his life for my sins and the sins of people from every nation and tongue and tribe. You are worthy because you are holy. You are worthy because you are are loving. You are worthy because you are a God of justice. You are worthy because you are a God of mercy and of grace. You are worthy because you've given us a word that we can proclaim, that we can read, that can be a balm to a hurting soul. You are worthy because we have the Holy Spirit that dwells in us. You are worthy 
You're worthy of our praise. You're worthy of our glory in you. Father, we approach this moment with humbleness as we, for a moment, pray with you on behalf of others. We pray for some folks that, that um, need some prayer. Caden. Pray for Caden Baker to continue to recover. We pray for a speedy recovery. We pray for a quick recovery. We pray for doctors to continue to help him with his case. But we pray for our, our brother Newcomb. We pray that you would help him in these days. It seems his body is getting weaker, but we know that you are in charge of bodies. I pray that you would help my dear brother in Christ. That you give him a good day and a good afternoon. I pray for his precious wife. I pray for their family. I just pray that you, you help this family in this moment. And help, help him to have good days. We lift up some names to you. People that we've been praying for about cancer. And we know that, that um, sometimes you choose to heal. And sometimes you choose not to. But Lord, while these people have breath, we are going to bring them to you. And we're going to selfishly pray for your sovereign healing in their body. We call them out by name. And we believe there's something about bringing the name of others before you. And so we pray for Mosey and Jeff and Sheila and Jane and Charles and Allie, and Mike, and Corbett, and Ricky. And Lord, we believe that there is power in prayer. We believe that you are working in the lives of these individuals. Some of them you might be drawing into you, even using this terrible disease. I pray for the doctors and the nurses and the cases and the treatment plans and the radiation and the chemos and the surgeries. I pray for some like Mosey and Jeff who just in the last few weeks have heard these diagnoses. <laughs> Sovereign and supernatural healing. Lord, I know that this morning there are probably a room full of prayer requests. If we were to ask for a show of hands, it would be volumes of hands going up so we know there are burdens on your people today and so we bring those to you as well knowing that you know what's in the hearts of your people what's weighing them down today father we would we would thank you this morning we thank you that when we look at this budget we look at this resources you've given us that you are opening the hands of earthen vessels and you're flooding the storehouse and Lord we don't believe people are just giving to keep the lights on they're giving because they want to see the gospel go to the ends of the earth they want to see the gospel penetrate our community and our neighborhood our friends our co-workers our work sites our schools our prisons our hospitals Father, I thank you for the faithfulness of your people. I pray that we be good stewards of what you've blessed us with and continue to bless us with. That we might glorify you in your name and be on mission for you, for your kingdom. Father, as we continue to worship, I pray for those today. Maybe they're far from you. Maybe they're here for one last time to see what you might say to them. Maybe today you'll change their life. Maybe for someone who just walked in or they're here for whatever reason. The Lord, you may draw them unto you. Change them forever. They may put all of their trust in you. Father, let us worship you now in spirit and truth. In Christ's powerful name, amen. amen. Let's all stand together and continue to worship. We're going to start with ancient words.
you got a Bible, if you'll take it, turn with me to Genesis chapter 41. Genesis chapter 41. As you're making your way there, I'll tell you about uh, a staple of an item in our house. Something we have to have all the time in stock in our house is popcorn. I don't know about y'all, but we got a kid that if he could, that's all Josh would eat would be popcorn, pepperoni, and cheese. That's it. He could live off of that. And so I will tell you, I've told you a little bit about popcorn in the past, but I just want to remind you of this, and you'll, this will make more sense as we walk through this sermon about popcorn. And I see some folks in here that maybe are a tick older than I am. And, uh, and so popcorn for you used to be very different, right? I've, I've talked about how popcorn, uh, many of you popped it on the stove, right? You had to stand there with it. We still do this in our house sometimes as a delicacy. Uh, far too many of them like that, and I really think, what a waste of time. There's a button on the microwave, right? <laughs> but here's what I found out, and I've always said, my, my generation, this popcorn analogy, has so much potential and so much connection, because here's really what happened. <coughs> my parents had to pop popcorn on that terrible stove, and they also had to wait for a lot of things in life, and they had to live very patiently until they could get those things. And then my generation came along, and we realized we didn't have to pop popcorn on the stove anymore. Not only was there a bag, there was a button. <laughs> Praise the Lord. When Josh could make his own popcorn, we had freedom. <laughs> and so my generation came along, and not only could they put a bag of popcorn in a microwave and push a button, and in three minutes or less, they could have popcorn, we also wanted everything right then. We looked at our parents and maybe they had worked and worked and worked until their mid-40s to be able to buy things and have nice things or even later. And my generation came along, kids of the popcorn button, and said, I want it now. And we borrowed all the money we could borrow and we bought all the houses and boats and RVs and everything else we could, could ever afford or at the bank would ever loan us money for. And then one day we realized we couldn't serve the kingdom because of that stupid popcorn button. <laughs> and you're going to see this morning, we're going to talk about patience. <clears throat> patience. And you're going to hear about a man, and I'm going to pick up his story for you before we read in Genesis 41 and remind you where he is. Joseph. We've been walking through Genesis. We'll get through Genesis this year, I promise. We're, we're, we're thinking about a man named Joseph, and here's what's happened in his life so far. He is probably about the age of 17 was sold by his own flesh and blood, sent off with the Ishmaelites. He finds himself in the home eventually of, a, of, of Potiphar and his wife, a woman who really is a wicked woman, lies about him, gets him thrown in prison. He is in prison, and when we closed out this story the Sunday before Father's Day, we read these terrible, terrible haunting words. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. And when we pick up in 41, you're going to hear, now it happened the end of two full years that Joseph, uh, that Pharaoh had a dream. Two long years after the cupbearer left, he's still in prison, waiting patiently. And so this morning, we're not going to read this entire text. It's a very long text. We're just going to pick up in chapter 41 of Genesis in verse 38. So if you want to stand in honor of the reading of the Lord's word, we'll pick up right there. Here's what it says. Then Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is a divine spirit? Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has informed you, all uh, you, all of this, there is no one so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and according to your command, all my people shall do homage. Only in the throne I will be greater than you. Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Amen. You may be seated. So here's what we're going to try to do because this is such a lengthy passage. This morning I'm just going to share with you three longer sentences that are going to kind of describe what we can see, how God uses sovereignty 
in the life of a, of a law of lost people in this story. And then we'll look at three specific words that might be some application for you in light of this story. Now, here's what I want you to hear this morning. I want you to hear that God is sovereign. I've been talking about this in this context and in this book. Understand this. God is sovereign. He is sovereign over everything in the entire universe. There is not a rogue molecule, one theologian says. He is sovereign over every heartbeat and breath. He is sovereign. You ready for this? He's sovereign over his church. He's sovereign over God's people. But here's what I want you to hear this morning. He is even sovereign over lost people who aren't his. How do we see sovereignty carried out in Joseph's life? From the very beginning of this story, from the porch, if you will, on which he's standing, he is so God is sovereign over everything. In other words, it's one thing to talk about the abstract nature of God being sovereign. But it's another thing to see sovereignty in this text, especially in this story, literally being prescribed and executed in human affairs. Here, here's what you're going to uncover today in this text. God intervenes and uses the lives, the actions, the intentions, and yes, even the dreams of those who aren't his. Because here's what we worry about sometimes. We say, Lord, you've got the church taken care of. You've got the people of God taken care of. You've got me taken care of. You've got my family you're watching over. But Lord, what about all the craziness that's going on in the world? What about, the, what about Ukraine? And what about China? And what about Cuba? And what about North Korea? And all of this. Understand this. All of human history is God's. Everything is the Lord's. How about another way of saying it? God's power is extends beyond believers. There's no evidence in this text that Pharaoh, the cupbearer, or any of the people involved in Pharaoh's inner circle are believers. But yet God is going to use them all. So let's just jump, jump. We're going we're gonna to go first three points, big longer sentences for you, and then we'll, for the simpletons, we'll have words at the end. Thanks. All right, here's the first thing. God planned Pharaoh's dreams. God planned Pharaoh's dreams. Now, here's the deal. Uh, chapter 41, verse 1, it happened at the end of two full years. Pharaoh had a dream. And behold, he was standing by the Nile. And lo, from the Nile there came up seven cows, sleek and fat, and they grazed in the marsh grass. Then behold, seven other cows came up uh, after them from the Nile, ugly and gaunt, and they stood by the other cows on the Nile bank of the Nile. The ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven sleek and fat cows. And Pharaoh awoke, and he fell asleep, and he dreamed a second time. And behold, seven ears of grain came up on a single stalk, plump and good. Then behold, seven ears, thin and scorched by the east wind, sprouted up after them. Then Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And so here's what I want you to understand. God is even working in the dreams of the Pharaoh of Egypt. Here's this man, and God is using him and his sovereignty to orchestrate a story where he's going to use the dreams of this man to get, to get poor old Joseph out of prison through the interpretation of these dreams. And he's eventually going to even use Pharaoh to elevate Joseph to a, a position of prominence so that ultimately when his family is hungry, there's a man in place that's going to make sure they get fed. And so, so understand that the first thing you just need to see is God planned Pharaoh's dream. And here's what I want you to know. God is working even among you and around you through people who don't know Christ. Man, you might be frustrated. Even right now, you might be saying, preacher, you don't know that manager at work. You don't know my brother. 
You don't know my family member. You don't know my neighbor. You don't understand the, the complexity of this situation. Let me tell you what. This situation was far, far more complex. Here's what I understand. God controls the human hearts, even of the kings. Even of the kings. And so God planned Pharaoh's dream. Here's the second thing I want you to know. God used the cupbearer just as Joseph had suggested. You remember when he said prison? Now, God, uh, Joseph probably knows more than, than we think he knew. And he probably might have even known a little more of the story that he's letting on. And remember, he says, hey, uh, cupbearer. Now, he knows what the fate of the other one is. <laughs> Don't remember me when you lose your head. But he says, cupbearer, when you get to where you're going, remember me. And the Bible says that, of course, he forgot him when he got where he was going. God used the cupbearer just as Joseph had suggested. But hear this. He used the cupbearer on God's timeline. The Bible says that it was two years. Listen to this, friends. Joseph was stuck in jail, kicking rocks for two more years. Thinking the whole time, Lord, I know this isn't the end that you have for me. I know this isn't the purposes you have for me. I know this isn't what I'm supposed to be doing. Lord, what's going on? God was working among even the lost cupbearer, someone who didn't know him. And it was on God's timeline. You know what some of you, and we're going to talk about patience towards the end of this ser service, uh, sermon, but, but just, just hear this. You are sitting here and here's what you're saying today. I wish there was a popcorn button in my life. <laughs> right? Man, don't, there's a, so many things in our life that we just say, Lord, I wish there was a popcorn button. I wish this popcorn button could make this illness and sickness go away. I wish this popcorn button would help me find my, a, a spouse. I wish this popcorn button would make this harshness and, and toughness of this life that I'm going through right now. But understand this. God delivers his people, but it's on his timeline. It's on his timeline. We need to be patient in the Lord. Understand this, too, about what was going on in this story. God directed Pharaoh's plan to elevate Joseph. It's a beautiful story in the scriptures. It's almost like Joseph wrote it. <laughs> he did write it. And he says, hey, you know what you need to find? Hey, Pharaoh, let me tell you what you need to find. You need to find a guy who can do these kinds of things. And then not only do you need to find a guy to kind of do these kinds of things, you need to find a guy that's going to set aside some grain and you need to get all this situation ready and you need to get your stuff together. Because let me tell you, I've interpreted these dreams God's going to enact all of this. It's going to happen. And then God directed Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said, we've looked all over. And here's the thing. We can't find anyone like you. You're the man. You're it. Now understand. I, 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 if you can understand that all of this story that continues to drip with sovereignty and ooze with sovereignty... That God is working to get this man in a place so he can <laughs> feed his family and preserve the history of a people. That's what all of this about is about. It's not about punishing Joseph. It's not about Joseph's sin. It's not even about his brothers. If you get to the end of this story, Joseph proclaims, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Even in the midst of your sinfulness, brothers, you were doing something that only God can do. God directed Pharaoh's plan, and he elevated Joseph into a position. And listen to this. Out of all of this, here's what I want you to hear. God is working in your life. God is working in your life, even in the face of difficult people who may not know Jesus. I look back at my life, and there were times I thought, well, this lost person is going to be the one that determines whether this door gets opened or closed for me. And let me tell you what, there's been moments where that lost person was used by God in a sovereign way 
in a supernatural way to orchestrate the plan that God had for my life. And in that moment, I, I couldn't even understand it. But here's what I needed to do. I needed to trust the Lord. Amen. So as I, I thought about this text, I thought about this story. You can read this story. It's a long story. You can read the dreams. He articulates the dreams more than once. Joseph is just so faithful in all of this. But here's the thing. I thought and I thought and I thought about this. And it's such a great story. But then I said, Lord, what can your people do with this on Monday? Because, see, that's really the aim of preaching. If you ever wonder how the sausage is made, anybody can tell you the story and the history. Anybody can tell you what year uh, so-and-so happened. But here's, what, here's where the real heart of the preacher is, telling you and showing you some application that we can draw out of this. So here's three words for you. I understand there was three points, and there's three, that's six. There might even be more. It could be a nine-point sermon, but we're just going to say it's a three-point sermon. Three words that you can live by considering the scenario of this story. Here's the first one. You can be patient. You can be patient. Listen, I think there's probably one thing more people struggle with than anything is patience. Patience. Most people that really know me say, I'm not, I, I struggle with patience. I'm maybe not a very patient person. Here's the thing. Did you know this? Joseph was sold, like I said, at probably 17. We know he spent at least two years in prison here. We know that according to this text, that he's elevated in this position at the young age of 30. You ready for this? He spent 13 years waiting. He spent 13 years. Now, he still hasn't even seen everything come to fruition. He hasn't seen, he hasn't seen the face of his family. But he's had a dream about it way back over here. 13 years earlier, he can remember he's holding on to it. For 13 years, his life has been a roller coaster, sold into slavery, Potiphar's wife, prison, called out to interpret this. And here he is. In fact, the Bible says that they hastened to go get him out of the dungeon and bring him there. And they cleaned him up so he could come before Pharaoh to help him interpret this dream. Listen to this, friends. We struggle with patience. Let's just be honest. There are times in your life you press the popcorn button and it's still not fast enough. We've all stood there waiting to hear the last pop. As if this time it might pop quicker. We struggle with patience. Here's what I want to call out to you. Friends, God is doing things in his time and his way. And I would love, I've said this in the first service, I wish that as a pastor I had a popcorn button for you. I really do. Some of you have been in years of anguish. Some of you have been in years of struggling with lost friends that don't know Jesus. Some of you have been in years of heartbreak. Some of you have been struggling with some, some careers and decisions and family issues. As a pastor, I wish there was a popcorn button for you so that all could be made well for you in your life. But I know that sometimes the Lord wants us to be patient. He wants us to, to walk through and be faithful to what God is doing in our life, knowing that he's working out all these things for us in his masterful way, in his time, according to his plan, we need to be patient. We often think that all of this life is really a sprint, but it's not a sprint. It is really a marathon. And the Lord has written this beautiful story in your life. And later we'll look at a verse that, that, that tells that about us. Here's another word you can do. Just a real simple word. You can be, you can have some humility. I think by this moment in Joseph's life, he wasn't the same 17-year-old kid that stood there in his coat of many colors on the front porch in my sanctified imagination and said, hey boys, y'all have fun out there working. I might bring y'all a sandwich later. It'll be baloney. Me and Pops here, we're going to be eating steak. He was not a very humble man. 
But it seems at least by this moment, he's found some humility. You know what he could have said? Maybe the old Joseph would have said this. Hey, Potiphar, or hey, Pharaoh, I know a man that can do that. Let me just tell you, you're going to search the entire kingdom. You're only going to find one dude, and it's going to be me. He didn't say that. He said, this is the kind of man you need. And Pharaoh said, we've searched and we can't find anyone like you. Would you do this job? And the Lord, in his humility, elevates him to being second in command of all of Egypt so that he can execute God's plan for God's glory. Listen, while we're waiting, while we're waiting, we need to have some humility and say, Lord, I know you're writing a plan for me. I know you're crafting a glorious and beautiful story. And I'm going to humbly wait and be patient in the Lord. How about this? How about just trust? Trust. Some, some more things, three more ideas here. That, again, that makes it a nine-point sermon, but it's fine. You know the number one rule of preaching? All rules are made to be broken. That's what my preaching professor used to say. All right, so here's the thing. What can you trust in? Here's the first thing you need to trust in. Here it is. The first thing you need to trust in is you need to trust in salvation in God through Jesus. If you've never done that, you need to do that today. If you have never put all of your trust and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, in his gospel, in the finished work of the cross, in the empty tomb, you are what they call lost. You need to be saved. The Bible uses that word. Paul uses that word. That's not a Baptist word. Paul says you need to be saved. Here's how you're saved. You turn from your sins and you trust in the Lord. You turn from your sins and you turn towards obedience and you follow Jesus. It's just that simple. And you put all of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So I would imagine that today we've had probably certainly kids. We may have some adults here today. And you may say, I have never, ever put my trust in Jesus. Here's one thing you need to do. You need to trust in Christ for salvation. Amen. How about this? You can be Baptist and not be a believer. You can be Baptist and not be a believer. You can come down, fill out a card, join a church, and be lost. You need to be saved if you've never been saved. If you've never met Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you do that today. How about this? You can trust. What else should I trust in while I'm waiting? While I'm patiently waiting, humbly waiting for the Lord and his plan in my life, what else can I do? I can trust in his word. I can trust in these 66 books that I can open it up and I can go to Psalms and I can say, Lord, I want to be delivered today. And I can read, I can read the Psalms of David of a man who in the middle of a, of a tense time with Saul was praying that he would be delivered. We can read about the gospels and read about how Jesus cared for the sick and he cared for those that were sin sick and he cared for those that were emotionally sick. And he helped the lame and the blind and the sick. We can read of that. We can read of the great prophets as they proclaimed doom, but yet they were patient and they were humble. We can trust in his word. You can get up in the morning and you can open the Bible and you can trust that it's the word of God and that it will feed your soul. You can trust. You want to trust something? I told my Sunday school classes, it just drove this idea home to me. This week, five people tragically lost in a submersible. Five people tragically lost this week in a submersible. And here's what I, I was sitting there, and I saw on the TV, I saw how deep they were, and I saw how deep a whale goes. I know, because I've been to Sunday school, everybody thinks Jonah was swallowed by a whale. It was really a great fish. We don't know if it was a whale or not. It looks better than kid books. But here's what I do know. Man, you want to have some excitement in the Word of God? I know that a great fish swallowed Jonah, and he was in the belly of a fish three days and three nights, and that fish took him to some great pressures, and God preserved his life. 
You know what I can do? Even this week as I've read of this, I can say, man, I trust even in the book of Jonah. It's not, a, it's not an allegory. It is a true story of a true man who was disobedient and God got him on the right path through a great storm and a great fish. You can trust in the word of God. You get up in the morning and your sin sick soul needs something. You can read the word of God. Even the Proverbs will tell you how to live. You can trust in the word. How about this? You can trust in God's plan for your life. You can. You know, we have some verses in the scriptures that unfortunately through the years have become, they become cliches. They just become Facebook posts and, and Instagram posts. And we don't even maybe know what they really mean. Romans 8, 28 is one of those verses that you either ought to have highlighted, memorized, underlined, written somewhere. And you ought to know what the word of God says about this. Because you can trust in his plan for your life. Hear it. And we know that God causes all things. You know what all things mean? All things. God causes all things to work together. Hear this now. Hold on. A pit. Potiphar's wife. A prison. Soon to be a palace. The Bible says we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So when you say, man, I just don't know about this story. I don't know about this plan. I don't know what the Lord's doing. I'm struggling. I don't like it. Hold on. Romans 8, 28. For God causes all things to work together. For the good, for those who love God and are called to his, according to his purposes. Here's what I want you to hear this morning. While you're patiently waiting, and some of you have been patiently waiting a long time. Some of you are God's children in the minivan. God, are we there yet? Are we there yet, God? How much longer, Lord? While you're waiting patiently, you can hold to Romans 8, 28, that in your story, God's providence and sovereignty is being worked out. And sometimes it's hard and sometimes it's difficult. And sometimes we feel like we're in that pit. Sometimes we feel like we're in the dungeon of the prison. We say, Lord, how much longer? But Lord, I can trust you that you're working all of this out. For your glory and for my goodness and ultimately for God's purposes. Here's the thing. In a moment, we're going to do what we do. We're going to stand and we're going to sing. And I'd ask you some questions. Number one, have you put all of your trust in the Lord? Have you put all of your trust in God? Have you put all of your faith in the Lord? And can you say, Pastor, I'm a saved human being. Because I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you haven't, listen, I, you might not want to come during the invitation time. You may want to talk privately. You may want to text me. Everybody in here ought to have my number. It's been on the screen. If you don't, the person sitting to your left or right of you does. And if you don't have it, you can come ask me afterwards. You can text me and say, I just need to talk about my salvation. And I'll let you buy me some eggs. <laughs> this morning, you may say this, Lord... I've been trusting you, but I haven't been very patient. Will you, Lord, would you help me to be patient before you, knowing that you're writing a beautiful script for me? Some of you today just haven't trusted in general. You just, you're, you're micromanagers, you're, you want to write your own script, you don't like anything the Lord's doing. Understand, the Lord wants you to trust his story. And maybe this morning you just need to come to the altar. You might need to pray right where you're at and say, Lord, help me to trust you tomorrow. Help me to be patient with your plan in my life. Let's stand together. Father, your goodness, and your love, and your mercy is always on display. You're such a good God to us.
even in the face of tragedies, we know you love us. Even in the face of betrayal, blind, pits, dungeons, you love us. Let us be patient as we wait. Your glory is always on display. I pray that as we sing, that hearts might be changed, directions might be changed, paths may be changed. I pray that, that for that one person who maybe today doesn't know you, maybe you draw them into a relationship with you, and change them forever. I thank you for your word and the truth of it direction of it, the power of it. Bless us as we worship and respond. In Jesus' name, amen.